I don't want to leave my gift behind. I'm going to give it to my guys. <laughs> Thank you. I. Y lo quiero a ustedes. Thank you. Hi, you guys. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Melissa Murray. I'm a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. I'm delighted to be here at our sister school down the peninsula, San Jose State. Thank you for having us. And please join me in welcoming someone who needs no introduction, Sonia Sotomayor. <laughs> You're going to tell them how we know each other, won't you? I first met the justice over 10 years ago. Um, I was interviewing with her for a position um, as her clerk when she was then on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. And I just wanted to open by sort of telling a kind of personal story, which I think opens up the book. Um, the book is an incredibly personal account, I think more personal than most memoirs are. Um, but I really learned a lot when I read the book, and one of the things that really gave me some insight was, I was I've was i always reflected on the interview that we had back in 2000. I was a second year law student. Um, I didn't have a lot of grades at the time. I did, certainly didn't have a lot of good grades at the time. Um, and I was interviewing for this job with someone who everyone knew was a really fantastic jurist. And I get to the interview with you and you start asking me questions and you ask me to tell you about my family. So I tell you that my parents emigrated here from Jamaica in the 1960s, that I'm the first person in my family to go to law school, that my father died when I was young and then you asked me of what did he die and I said, well, he had heart disease but it was complicated because he was a diabetic for most of his adult life. And we kept talking about this and my mother was a nurse and I get back to New Haven, and the whole time I'm riding on the subway, I'm mortified. I had this opportunity to talk about myself, to play myself up, to talk about the law and show how smart I was, and I'm telling you all of this incredibly personal information that I hadn't told anyone at law school. Like, no one talked about this at law school, even though now in retrospect, I know there are lots of people like me, but at the time, privilege was sort of a presumption, and we just didn't talk about it. And it wasn't until I read this book that it became clear to me. For years, I had been thinking I got this clerkship in spite of everything I said. And it seemed to me after reading it that I had gotten it because of it. Exactly. Um. <laughs> no, I, and, and let me say something. I have my pick of the smartest people in the country. Because that's who applies for Supreme Court clerkships and for Court of Appeals clerkships, because every Supreme Court clerk was on the Court of Appeals. If I picked only smarts, I wouldn't be a happy person. I pick on the basis of, are they good people? And do they want to do good things? Now, as you know from the variety of people that I've had clerking for me, that I don't define good thing in a narrow way. I have law clerks that are in business law. I have law clerks who are in corporate law. I have law clerks that have done everything. But all of you have that good thing in you. That the book is so personal and so different from other memoirs, but yet you stop short at the point where you are confirmed to the district court. So why did you choose that moment to end the book? And does it mean there's another book in the offing? Um, <laughs> another opportunity? Or is there something particular about that moment? Well, there were a combination of reasons for stopping at that point. The most important was the reason for the book. I've been describing it at lunchtime with a group of students um, and faculty. I did the, the book as a therapy for myself um, during the first three summers of my uh, Supreme Court existence. I had been thrust into this world platform, wrenched, and I'm using very descriptive words because they were what I was feeling, wrenched from a life I loved. You have to understand, I loved being a Court of Appeals judge. You know that, Melissa. I loved the life I had in New York. Um, I, one of my friends once said that I may be the only person he knows 
that took advantage of everything New York offered. I did. Um, I was out sometimes five or six nights a week. Um, <laughs> I come to Washington and I'm out maybe two nights a week. <laughs> it's a really different life. And there are a lot of emotions that come with being a Supreme Court justice. Uh, among the beginning ones that sort of start to plague you, and there are real, no real answers initially, are, why am I here? Why me? And how I chose to sort of avoid those big issues and that sort of emotion was to go back into my life, into that which I knew, and draw security from my own life. Um, and it gave me a sense of grounding myself in the person who I am. And that's why the book became personal, by the way, because it, you're all a part of my therapy. In fact, I had a reporter in Chicago come up and say, are you sure you haven't ever had therapy? <laughs> And, and I looked at her and I said, yeah, this book. <laughs> um, it, it, I understood, and, and a lot of that was questions that kids were asking me my first year, that my life resonated with a lot of people. That lots and lots of people, and not just Latinos, but lots of different people, uh, shared many of the experiences that I had had. But we're all silent. You know, every one of my close, college and law school friends has come back to me after the book to tell me things that I never knew about them. Mm -hmm. You're right, you go through school, and, and it's one of my greatest regrets, by the way, that I did this even in school. You don't share emotions with your friends in school. You're busily talking about school and the activities that you're involved in and trying to get through your days, but you don't talk about feelings often, except hating professors someday. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, and I don't mean to make light of it, but yeah, that, that, that was really it. And the reason I knew this was Justice Souter, my predecessor. I went to lunch with him about a year ago, two years ago now, when I was struggling with the questions I described. And at a certain point after we we had talked about the book and what I had done, and he had read it and we discussed it. And he said to me, Sonia, you're just putting off with what every new justice does their first summer. You use the book to escape. Mm -hmm. And I realized he was right. That's what I had done. So Justice Souter is an interesting counterpoint because he is famously reclusive. Um, as soon as the court turn was over, he was in his Jetta and back to New Hampshire where his family had a house. Um, you, by contrast, are much more public in your role as a justice. Is that a conscious choice to sort of be out, even if it's just two nights a week in DC, but to be very public and interacting with the public as a justice? I'm out two nights a week, um, but that's socializing. Um, when I was in New York, I used, to social, I used to do my activities and then I'd socialize. I've also gotten older and it's harder to go to bed that late anymore. Um, now that's not, that's serious, and that's a bad thing, but it is serious. Um, I, I consciously thought about what I could do in my role as a justice. Everybody asks me what's gonna be my legacy. They even asked that at the hearing, at the Senate hearing. And I answer that question in my book by saying, I have no idea what my legacy as a justice will be because every day I'm growing in my role. And on some levels, to predict it is to limit myself because once I define what I want to do, then that's what I become instead of letting myself develop and grow with the job and with society. Every year we get new issues. What legacy I may or may not leave, I can't really fully control. But what I can control is what I do with the position outside the courtroom. And the book showed me 
that I had a platform that was given to me through the position to use to interact with people who weren't lawyers mostly and to talk to them about my passion, law. You know, I, I talk to people every day and I tell them, the law affects every single part of your life. There isn't any relationship that you have in life that law doesn't affect. I use the example at lunch with a group of students of red and green lights. All of you go out every day, you stop at red, you go on green, and if you don't, you're gonna get a ticket. Um, or maybe you get away with it, but you're a little afraid looking around for the ticket, okay? <laughs> the point is that that's a law that helps regulate how we get places and helps us compromise our personal interest by ensuring that we give up a little bit of time in stopping at red to get everybody to get to where they're going more safely. And there isn't a human relationship starting with marriage, <laughs> birth, um, work, that isn't controlled by laws. Now there are other organizing principles to communities. Morality plays a part in it very important part. But the law is sort of the skeletal muscle of the whole interaction. And that's my passion. And I knew that I could share that with people and perhaps inspire them not to be lawyers, but to be better citizens, to be more concerned people, to be involved and take charge of how they lived their life and how they responded to things in the world they didn't like in the law. And the one thing I don't want you to do is to accept that laws happen to you. They don't happen to you. They get passed by people, which means they can get unpassed by people. And so, um, I realized that if I did that, and that's what I spent my time doing, particularly with young people, before they could get disillusioned. You know, the wonderful part of college is that most of you, despite the economy, are here because you have hope. And I really want you to carry that hope for your entire life. And if I can play a part in inspiring some of that, then I've left an important legacy. I will be alive after I die until the last person who I've spoken to has died. That's a hell of a long time, guys. <laughs> So you have a lot in common with a lot of the students here at San Jose State. Um, today we've talked to a number of students and almost to a person, people have talked about situations where they felt sort of alone or isolated in their experience, um, not being someone who is familiar with the world in which they're operating with. And, and from the book, it's clear that there have been many situations in which you've been, you felt isolated. How have you managed to battle back from that sense of isolation to sort of embrace the isolation and sort of work through it to feel comfortable in situations that were not the ones you grew up in or the ones to which you were accustomed? When I became a Supreme Court Justice, I walked into a running conversation. You have to know that the justices stay together for a very long time. Um, you know, we have justices who have been there for 20 years or more. Nino Scalia just celebrated his 25th anniversary if it was last year or the year before. Um, they have a continuous conversation going on, we do, about our views and our beliefs. And I walked into the conversation and you feel like you have no idea what's going on. We'd have conferences where 
I thought I had studied the issue, I had studied the cases, and one of my colleagues would say, I told you guys this in blank case. And I'm sitting there panic saying, I didn't read blank case. <laughs> Who mentioned it? And I would sometimes reach back to get the, uh, the brief to see where it was in the brief that I had missed. And they'd still be talking and, ra and railing and doing whatever they were doing. Eventually, uh, Justice Stevens would lean over and he would often say to me, Sonia, this has been a bugaboo with him forever. <laughs> he brings it up in every case. <laughs> Just ignore it. <laughs> and I went, Phew. I figured out a long, long, long time ago that I spent many unfortunate times afraid of what I didn't know instead of embracing the fact that there was no reason I should have known. And by that I mean, um, like my example in the book about Alice in Wonderland, I hadn't read under Alice in Wonderland. It wasn't part of the culture of a Latino family at the time. It's probably not a part of the culture now. Um, but, and, and my roommate Mary is the one who said the words, but I went and got it and read it because I understood I had missed something. And I am pretty open after that experience with Justice Stevens, even today, when they start talking about something and I don't know what it is, I'll just say, I'm showing my ignorance, but please explain what that is. I don't say I'm showing my stupidity because there's a difference between them. Ignorance are things you don't know, but can learn. You're stupid when you don't ask questions. Okay, that's different. Um, and at, that's really how I've mostly dealt with my isolation, um, is, is trying not to run from the things that scare me, but try to figure out how to confront them and really how to do something about them. You know, I'm still terrified about writing, so what do I do? I pick really smart law clerks. Uh, <laughs> no, I work with people who I hope are better writers than I am. So together, we produce something that's the best. So in the book, you mention sort of suffering from a kind of imposter syndrome. And psychologists have spent a lot of time dissecting imposter syndrome, and typically women are the ones who experience it. But it's this idea that you're in a situation and you feel like a fraud. Like you don't, you, 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 you're there, other people believe you deserve to be there, but secretly you feel you don't, that you don't. You don't feel. Um, and, you, and you suggest that, that that's been the case in your life. There have been places and times where you felt like an imposter that you were going to be found out as, as not being belonging or not being not supposed to be there. Um, what were those circumstances? It, do, do you feel like that now? God, yes. You... Yeah. Think about my Supreme Court nomination. We were just talking about yes. it before. Um, uh, Melissa and I were talking about a author who wrote a scathing article about me. Um, and that really hurt. And that really set up these antennas of imposter syndrome that were just quivering constantly. Um, quivering so much that I actually started thinking, why am I exposing myself to this? I should get out of this process as quickly as I can. I have a good job, I'm well respected. I'm not gonna do this to myself. It really took my friends to talk me out of it to support me and console me. Sometimes you need people to console you. Um, and that's what my definition of friends are. The people who push you to do better things than you can do on your own. If you have someone you call a friend who tells you you can't do that, then they're not a friend. They really aren't. Um, and for me, my friends are the ones who when I'm sitting, still quivering about myself, um, kick me in my butt. Sorry for the French, okay? And 
tell me that I have to do things. And I do that all the time. That really was um, imposter syndrome at its most active, the last the Supreme Court nomination. Do I still feel it? I do, when I'm writing an opinion that's important to me, the shooty dissent, um, you feel like you have to deep, dig really deep within you to express thoughts and uh, thoughts about an issue. Um, the Jones concurrence, others in which people have noticed my writing. Um, you, you struggle with, is this idea worthy of expressing? And those things are um, the insecurities. And I think minorities tend, and minorities and women tend to experience that a lot more. It doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that men are immune, mm -hmm. but I think that we grow up with more of that insecurity. But also, I, I think you're probably the target of it more often than not. I mean, during the nomination, I was stunned when I read the Jeffrey Rosen article that suggested that you were not smart. I mean, you were a summa cum laude graduate of Princeton. You'd won the Pine Prize. You were a Phi Beta Kappa. I mean, and you weren't smart? I, were you enraged when you read this? I mean, we were angry for you, but I can't imagine. I let you it. guys be angry. I was insecure. <laughs> 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 but your anger did help me get over it. No, 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 seriously. Um, and you almost have to look at others and those who care about you, their reactions to validate yourself sometimes. But what do you do in those situations where you're probably being underestimated? I try to prove people wrong. You know, I often said, when I got to the um, Court of Appeals, there was a not quite similar attack, but there was an attack on me. And people were uh, uh, suggesting that I wasn't qualified. It wasn't a job I really wanted. You know, I've publicly explained that I um, thought of saying no. I actually did at one point. But I didn't want the job. And then people started attacking me, and they got my back up. And that stubborn, obstinate streak in me just ran down my back. And I wasn't going to let them defeat me. I wish. I'll tell them this right now, much to their regret. They should have kept their mouth quiet, just delayed the process as long as they could, and I might have given up out of just frustration of sitting around in limbo. But as soon as they started to attack me, Darn it, they got my competitive spirit going. <laughs> you can't do that to me. So, so your chief at the court, John Roberts, um, famously said in an opinion that the best way to move beyond race is to stop talking about race so much. Um, you kind of came back with that in the Shooty dissent, which is, Shooty was a case um, involving the Michigan state constitutional amendment that prohibited affirmative action in all state dealings in Michigan. And there was a case before the court this term um, about the constitutionality of that amendment. And the justice read her dissent from the bench, which is a very unusual step. Um, most dissents are filed, but you chose to read this one from the bench, and you had some really exciting for people who care about the future of affirmative action, but also deeply validating for people who are just people of color in higher education about the role of race and how important it is to engage questions of race. Can, can you speak a little bit about why you felt you wanted to read that from the bench and why you made that dissent? If I may just explain something, my dissent was very long, much yeah. longer than the majority opinion. I couldn't read my dissent. <laughs> When people talk about reading the dissent, they're talking about reading a summary. Right. Just so you're aware, the non-lawyers here are aware of that. Um, people think that it was only because it was that case. 
But the truth is that I had just um, a few months before been at my alma mater, Yale Law School, interviewed by Linda Greenhouse, who was a famed reporter on the court for the New York Times for decades. Um, and she's now an, a, a professor at Yale. And she was asking me questions. And she asked me why I hadn't ever read a dissent. And I told her that I thought it was um, just an attempt by justices to, um, uh, to get a little publicity, OK? Um, because people should be reading the decisions and not responding to the dissent. And she said to me during that interview, oh, Justice, I really wish you would rethink this. And what she did was, um, the day after, she sent me an article by someone who wrote about why those oral dissents were important. Mm -hmm. And I read the article, and believe it or not, I am open to change. I do uh, listen to people. And the article was explaining, which I hadn't thought about, that today's press, unlike yesterday's press, doesn't have more than 10 minutes to file their stories. Because the internet has made filing of stories so fast paced that inevitably, unless someone summarizes their position um, in important cases, the press is going to get the reporting wrong. And it's also a statement about the importance of the issue, not to the justice, but to the people involved in the issue in question. And in fact, um, I was out with some friends this summer, um, and a woman came up to me and said, I didn't want to interrupt you during your meal, which I was grateful for. And she said, I was on the losing end of a case many, many years ago in state court. And the only thing that made me survive losing the case was that the dissenter understood what I was saying. Please don't ever give up dissenting. It's important to the losers, too. But that was after the fact. But before the fact, I realized um, I only had one justice joining me in shooting. If I wanted what I was saying to be heard, I had to summarize it. And I think by summarizing it, people actually understood or were willing to listen to what I said. But I still haven't done it, and I won't do it um, frequently. But I do understand when the issue is important to explain because people may not ever get to the real reasons, reading your dissent is important. What about the sentiment in the dissent? The idea that we won't be able to sort of deal with racial inequality without actually engaging the question of race forthrightly, even though it may be an uncomfortable conversation to have. That's exactly what I said in my dissent, because I know it's true. You know, a lot of people, uh, when President Obama was elected, said um, racism, no one can say that racism ex exists today. That'd be a shock to a lot of people, <laughs> all right? Um, the reality is that it is embedded in our society. It's one of the points I was trying to make in our dissent. You can't, whether you dub it intentional or unintentional, the economic difference between blacks, Hispanics, and the larger society and Native Americans isn't happenstance. As much as people will want to say that our segregation is an issue long gone, it's not all that long gone. It took us close to 185 years to live with segregation, and we're less than 60 years before it was declared unlawful, and we're only about 40 before we actually put it into practice, because Brown and versus Board of Education was decided in 1954. But we were still struggling in the courts with this issue into the 1970s. So we're not going to undo all of that overnight. You can't wish it away. 
you have to work with it. You have to understand that education is still horrible for the poor. And that most of the poor, not exclusively, by the way, but a lot and a lot of the poor are people of color and immigrants, because they too suffer the scourge of segregation that happens because of economics. Now, the economics didn't happen on their own. They were created in a system that we live in. And so for me, we have to talk about these things. We have to talk about that a fundamental finding by the lower court below was that the University of Michigan had tried to increase their numbers without race conscious decision making and they had failed. So if they had failed trying, how is race consciousness going to succeed? Race or a lack of race consciousness going to succeed? And it's also because so many people misunderstand what affirmative action is today. They don't realize that the court has already told schools they can't set quotas, they can't use race as an exclusive tiebreaker among students, they can only consider it as one among many factors. And as a result, it no longer is the system that people resented so much in the past when it was a quota system. But I think most schools have stopped that, thankfully. So can we talk a little bit about your family, who play a really big part in the book? Um, you're incredibly close to your mother, Selena. But that closeness wasn't always something that was natural to you all. You talk about how your father's alcoholism actually kept your mother a little bit distant from the family until his death. What was it like? What was the process of sort of reconciling with her and sort of forging a new relationship with her, first as a child, but then later as an adult? Well, it wasn't as a child. And in fact, um, when my dad died and my mom's behavior began to change, she was home rather than out all the time. Um, she was more interested in the home. While my dad was alive, since she wanted to escape the situation, the house was always a mess. My mom, I didn't know my mother's a, an obsessive compulsive. The house became immaculate. And regretfully, her daughter has turned out like her now. Um, <laughs> we are creatures of our parents, by the way. I had no idea I was an obsessive compulsive, and I am. Um, but that's from my mom. I was suspicious of it. I kept waiting for it to end. And I was angry at her for a long, long time. And the book describes how I felt abandoned by her to my father's alcoholism. And it was a challenge as a child. Um, and the hardest part was that I knew he loved me but he did such painful things to me. And that's a hard thing to reconcile in your life, having a parent who you know loves you, but doesn't love you enough, you think, to be able to change destructive behavior. Mm -hmm. And that for a child is very difficult to internalize. I think I, forg I, I forgave my father faster than I forgave my mother because I saw her as stronger than my father. Mm -hmm. And so it took me a lot longer to engage in the conversation with her about it. And the book, in some ways, doesn't go through that story in its painful detail because it's private to us. Mm -hmm. we, we, private in the sense of it was a joint effort by us. And, and one reached in stages, not overnight. Something would happen, and I would blow up at her and would have to catch myself and come back and explain what button she had touched. Something as simple as, um, 
I spend all this time finally putting myself together. I'm a judge now, by the way. And I buy a beautiful outfit. I get matching shoes and a matching pocketbook. That's not me, OK? I have gorgeous jewelry on. I even put on makeup, which is like strange for me, OK? And she says, oh, that's very nice. But you know you have to do your nails. And I just hit the ceiling, OK? I can never satisfy you no matter what I do. You're always complaining. Um, and I, I could tell you how it went on and on. Um, it took us, this is a tiny little piece of what I'm explaining. It took us a long, long time to talk through how insecure I was about my looks, how the Jackie Onassis of the projects had really created such bad feelings in me about myself. Um, all of that conversation came from that one moment. And it wasn't just one conversation. It was a series of them over time. And that issue took time to put to bed. And it was a small one among much bigger ones, by the way. But it, it was reflective of what we had to do together. Mm -hmm. It takes, it took some self-awareness by me of what was troubling me and what was deep inside of me and some trust in her that she would actually accept what I said without attacking back and without blaming me. And that trust is one that requires a parent and child to be open to just listening to the emotions. And that's hard to do, but my mother at every stage of our discussion, never turned it back on me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what most of us are always afraid of, that our parents are going to criticize us worse than we criticize ourselves. Mm -hmm. I, I'm making a generalization, but I think that's partially true. I know that mothers can usually touch more buttons than anybody else in the world <laughs> because they're touching the sore points. And it mm -hmm. takes a lot to trust enough to really have that dialogue. And yet your mother was your fiercest advocate mm -hmm. when you were dealing with your juvenile diabetes, at least initially. She was the one who identified the trial study at Jacoby Hospital and took you there. Exactly. She protected you when the treatment just got too much. Um, was there a and my mom moved us out of the projects. Mm -hmm. My family criticized my mother for mi moving to the middle of nowhere. In a few years, they all followed us. <laughs> but they thought she was crazy, OK? Um, my mom is the one who found her own educational opportunities. And when we were in high school, uh, got herself into college to become a registered nurse. She is a fierce advocate. But that sense of being abandoned as a child takes a long time to get over. Mm -hmm. So there's a part in the book where you go to your mother um, just to get a sense of her relationship with your father before you actually knew them as a couple. You say you, you never remembered a warm moment between them, but, and, and you're actually shocked by how grief-stricken she is after his death. And then she tells you this story, and it turns out that they had this incredible relationship that you had no idea about. And in fact, your father had been very supportive of your mother in a way that few men of his generation were. Like He encouraged her to go to nursing school, encouraged her in her career. He almost sounds a lot like Justice Ginsburg's husband. Absolutely. In a lot of ways. Um, well, like, when you think about that, like, like, how unusual was it for a man of your father's generation in a community like that to be as supportive of his wife in that way? Amazingly unusual. First of all, no one but my mother she was the only female in the family who, after having children, went to work. Um, all of my aunts stayed home. So that was already a difference, the fact that my father um, encouraged her. 
She got her practical nursing degree before I was born, and my father encouraged her to do it and to go out and work. Um, that was critically unusual, but I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. It took writing this book until I understood how unusual my father was, because I didn't see it. I should have seen it in the small things. He was the cook in the family. My mother, when he died, um, I talk in the book about my initially going out to buy stuff to try to get her out of her depression, what I perceived as depression, of her grieving, um, that I had seen him buy. But I also found out, I don't think I said this in the book, that she didn't really know how to cook initially. She had to teach herself. <laughs> Um, and she did a really good job at that after he died. But that was even unusual. Mm -hmm. I had an uncle who was a great cook because that's what he did as a merchant marine. And yet when he was home, his wife cooked. And so I, I, it, sometimes we make assumptions about our parents that we never dispute, that we never undo mm -hmm. because we just don't ask questions. I've told many, many audiences that one of the most important lessons I've learned about this in this book is if you have a living parent, if you have living parents, living grandparents, um, relatives, talk and actually listen to their stories. How many of you have been at family parties or family dinners and your relative starts telling a story you've heard a million times. <laughs> Sometimes you repeat a line that you know they're going to say. <laughs> um, and you walk away. Everybody gets up with their glass and runs out of the room, <laughs> except the new visitor who uh, hasn't heard the story before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was like that, too. I made a lot of underlying assumptions about stories my mother and family told me because I had never sat down to actually ask them, how did they feel when that thing happened, when that story happened? Why has it stayed such a vivid memory for them? What are the lessons they learned from that? And those questions developed a rich history that I knew nothing about. I really wish I had done it earlier. I did a college paper on my family, and I really should have been taught how to do interviews. I wish I could redo those interviews now. Your grandmother was the backbone of your family, and she loved your father fiercely. He was her firstborn son, and by extension, loved you fiercely. What was it like to have her be the kind of mother figure in your early childhood? You know, I say in my book that every successful person, every successful child has to have someone who believes and loves them unconditionally. Now, that doesn't have to always be a parent. It doesn't always have to be a grandparent. Sometimes it's a relative, an aunt. Sometimes it's a cousin. Sometimes it's a teacher who shows faith in you, who shows that they care about you and your future. Sometimes it's a church member, a synagogue member, someone that you've met who extends caring to you. But I don't think without it you can ever be successful in life. Without my grandmother, given the situation I was being raised in, I don't think I would have become who I am. Her confidence in my value is what led me, despite everyone's criticisms, to feel that I was OK. And when I say criticisms, I describe in my book that I was always a mess as a child. I was a tomboy, and my mother tells, my cousin still tells the story. My cousin Miriam, I describe her in the book. Every time we're at, we were recently at her birthday party, she turned 60 shortly after I did. She keeps reminding me that I'm older than she is. Um, it's only by a couple of months, you know? And she was telling 
all of our friends and relatives. You know, when I was little with Sonia, um, I was always so perfectly put together. And back then, her mother would put a ribbon in her head, and she'd shake her head, and the ribbon was out. Um, there was a reason for that. I have fine hair, and ribbons don't stay. But they didn't know that. They just thought, and she put a dress on me, and immediately it was dirty. I don't, uh, sometimes she would beg me to let my grandmother see me before I got the dress dirty. She would beg me as we were walking in the door. You were telling me that the other day about Josh. I got a lot of those stern warnings, you know. <laughs> um, um, we were talking earlier, and she was telling me a story about telling her son she'd kill him if he didn't behave on an airplane. Um, <laughs> not kill. Not, not quite. Not quite. <laughs> Mild discipline. <The> no. mi <laughs> Your mother didn't know anything about mild discipline, neither did mine. <laughs> mild discipline. No, but we've changed, right? <laughs> anyway, um, I really do think that we take confidence from that. The thing I hate the most is people who tell me, I did it by myself. Mm -hmm. And I look at them and say, nobody does, them, does it by themselves. Everybody gets some help somewhere. Um, because we don't survive without it. Sometimes it's even knowing that a friend loves you. That's help. Um, and so I, my grandmother was that rock for me. Um, whenever people criticized how, my playing and how much energy I had, um, and scolded me for it, she would tell them to leave me alone. That is so critical to you as a child, to have someone who doesn't criticize you every second. So one of the things I think I've wondered in reading the book, and I know some of the students have been wondering, is that as you progress through your career, you went from the Bronx projects to Princeton, and then on to Yale, and then to the DA's office, and then to Pavia and Harcourt, and then to the district court, the, the circuit court, and the Supreme Court. You've never lost touch with your family, even as you are living a life that probably few of them could have imagined. I mean, you interact with Jennifer Lopez and <laughs> her husband at the time. I mean, like, like let went to their mind. house and drank Don Perignon. Okay. I mean, you guys probably don't know about this because I didn't until I was much older. It was when I was growing up the finest champagne. Every bottle cost I want over a hundred dollars. Okay. And yeah, you're right. Those moments are very precious. It's the first and the last time. Okay. Um, <laughs> It, well, it blew my mind when I saw the picture of you hanging out with J-Lo. And I imagine <laughs> <laughs> it probably blows your family's mind. Like, like how, do you, how do you stay rooted to your people when you're straddling two worlds? I can't say it's easy, but it is doable. And part of it is walking the journey together. You know, I... I know that for many, many of my friends, in my friends of color at Princeton, I never met their parents while we were at school. None of their relatives ever came to visit them. Um, now, for some of them, it was distance. Some of them lived you know, in California and things like that, and I knew they couldn't afford it. But a lot of them were more local. They were from New Jersey, New York, places that they could visit. But they didn't come. And I think in part, and I assume that for many of their children, Princeton was so alien that they thought it would be alien for their parents. And I actually didn't think about that. I just invited my family. And they would come at least once a year, and sometimes more. Um, they, sure, it was strange for them. It was an environment that was strange for me and not for them. But there were things there 
that were beautiful. And they enjoyed seeing it as much as I enjoyed seeing it. And I had friends there, some of whom they knew, like Kenny, who had been in high school with me and lived in my mother's kitchen. He had the best appetite of any of my friends. <laughs> and my mother is, will never forget how many plates of her rice and beans he ate. <laughs> um, but, and I was never afraid of inviting those closest to me to come to my home. Um, Ted Shaw and I, Ted Shaw was the head of the um, NAACP, NAACP mm -hmm. for many years. He's now at Duke, I think. I think, or Columbia. No, no, he left Columbia and went to Duke. He's running their civil rights project now. You can see we know these people. Uh, Ted and I were in high school together, and we had a talk recently in front of an audience. And I was saying, you know, there were friends I brought home, but there were friends I didn't bring home. Because I thought that they might, I'd be embarrassed by them being there. Because I had seen their home and knew it was vastly different than mine. But over time, I got over that. I realized that um, I loved my family. And I loved the way they cared about people. And I didn't mind sharing that. So much so that the Fendi family, for those of you who don't know who the Fendi family is, it's one of the high fashion families in Italy. Needless to say, they have money to an extent that none of you do, okay? And I certainly <laughs> do, all right? Um, and they have homes all over the world. Um, they shared many a meal at my mother's table. And uh, my friend's uh, father of the Fendi family once said, it's what I grew up with. It's so wonderful. Um, it takes that pride in you. It takes you understanding that whatever foibles your family has, whatever you look at and sort of do this with, <laughs> you know, it's OK. Because most of them are very nice people. And they love and they care. They care about you, and they will almost always treat guests well. My family behaved best when I brought guests home. <laughs> um, and so I think that that's how I've done it. My entire family um, came to the White House to both of my swearing-in ceremonies. Some of them in wheelchairs, um, all of them the first time they had ever been to Washington, D.C. And um, they were blown away by the White House. Um, I was. And the thing is that I just can't forget, I can't put on the airs not to admit that when I've been in the White House, even now, I look and I say, I pinch myself and say, is this really real? <laughs> You know, it's not something I should take for granted. And I try to see it through their eyes. Um, and the third thing is, talk to them. Explain what you're feeling. Um, explain your own sense of isolation and how you're trying to overcome it. Take them on the journey with you. Cecilia Chavez, who is a master's student here in Mexican American studies, has the following question. Is Cecilia here? Cecilia, ¿dónde está? No, okay. She's being, she's being shy. No, uh, she can't be. Who knows Cecilia? Push her up. <laughs> Cecilia, come up here. I want a picture with you. If your question got picked, you can have a picture. Come on. Hello. Bob, where are you? Bob oh, hasn't okay. disappeared. Cecilia. Okay. Um, so Cecilia asks, was there a time in your life when you felt like giving up on a goal? And if so, how did you get past it and persevere? I did talk about it. I actually did seriously think of pulling out of the Supreme Court nomination. 
um, I, I, those attacks on me were getting to me. And um, I actually did what I talk about. I shared it with friends. And every one of them, they united behind my back. And literally every hour, I was getting a call, a message, a visit, um, telling me I was crazy. <laughs> and they talked me out of it. They gave me the strength. Um, you can't do it by yourself. You really do need help to do it. If you're looking for strength completely just within yourself, in those hard moments, you may not find it. it, it you know, no one has um, uh, a shield that protects them completely from disappointment. You have to search out those friends and not let yourself give in either to that insecurity or to your own sense of inadequacy. Um, and hopelessness, you always have to re remind yourself of what you've done. There isn't a student in this room who should ever give up. Because you've already taken the biggest and most important challenge of your life and succeeded. You got into college. You're here. Yeah. Do you know? Look around your neighborhoods. Look in your own family. How many of the people you know are never made it through college? Never got there to start with. Um, if you can defy all odds and get in, then you've got what it takes to make it. And so, you, but it's hard to do that when you're in the middle of struggling with a course and not really understanding the material. It's hard to do when you give your all to a paper and you get a C back, all right? Those disappointments can be really discouraging. But doing what I suggest, which is seeking help when you feel that you can't do something, eventually you'll figure out how to write a better paper. But you gotta get somebody to help you figure it out. Donna Rilano. Exactly. Donna, do you remember Donna Rilano from the book? Yes. Donna Rilano was your fifth grade classmate who mm -hmm. was getting gold stars. And you went to her and said, tell me how it's done, Donna. What's your secret? <laughs> and she, it's and she exactly what I did. She taught me how to study. And stuff that, how come you're supposed to know that? You're not born with that skill, you know? If you were, you'd get up from the crib and start reading a book <laughs> and underlining it, OK? We're not taught that. Someone has to teach it to you. Now, some things may come intuitively to you, um, but other things are not likely to if you don't know about them. So you do have to ask for help. So on a related note, Nicole DeLeon, who is an engineering student, is Nicole Where is here? Cecilia? She's <laughs> uh, Nicole may also be MIA, but she was Oh, a, no, venga acá. Oh, there she is. Come on. Nicole. Come on. Nicole, thank you. So Nicole was struck by the part in the book where you write, um, I honestly felt no envy or resentment, only astonishment at how much of a world there was out there and how much of it others already knew. I think part of that is like you weren't resentful because you were just going to find these other people and get them to tell you, to let you in on the secret. Absolutely. Yeah. I love hearing people's stories. If you haven't figured out, I wrote a book about stories. You know, Nina Totenberg of the NPR, she's a very famous um, commentary, a com commentator on court work, um, said to me when she read the book, it sounds like a fantasy, but I know it's true. <laughs> I, didn't, I wrote it and wanted to tell my stories. Um, we all have stories, and those stories are important to life. They're sort of important. Well, so a big theme in the book is mentorship. And like yes. you didn't get here alone and you asked for help along the way. 
how did you know who to identify for help and how to sort of construct your network? And like, the, your network is remarkable. And, and, and they're not just sort of just people in a network, they're your friends. So how did you find these people? How did you befriend them in the way that you have and sort of make them a part of your world? Every person in the world has good things about them. There isn't, look, I was a prosecutor and every once in a while, <laughs> I would come across a defendant, frankly, who was not salvageable, an evil, evil person. And when I was in their presence, I would shudder. But I understood pretty early on that that wasn't every defendant. And it even wasn't the majority of them. Almost every defendant I met had children, wives, husbands, relatives who loved them and who could talk about their kindness and generosity and giving. Every single person has something good. And what I do is in meeting people, I try to find that good. And I try first to learn from it what I can, but also to recognize it with that person. I had another friend who once said to me, darn Sonia, you expect me to do something and I just do it because I don't want to disappoint you. <laughs> well, if you look at the good in people, they don't want to disappoint you. And that's what I try to do. And so in my friendships, I really try, look, I can't be in touch with everybody I know every day. Um, it's impossible, uh, but I try when I have the opportunity, I'm here in, um, in California and I've had about six of my California friends come to my various events. This is a way for me to stay in touch with them when I can't do it every day. And that's what I do every day of my life, which is I'll think of someone and I'll shoot off an email. Um, it's hard for me to pick up the phone, largely because most of the time I'm just engrossed in other things. But if I'm worried about somebody or I start thinking about somebody, I know my brain is telling me it's been too long. Go reach out to them and send them an email. You can do that with your, you, well, maybe with most of you, you can't send emails to your parents. <laughs> but, you know, I don't call my mother every day. There are some people who do. But I make sure I call her every week, at minimum, because she knows I love her. She knows how much I love her. I wrote a whole book about it. <laughs> um, but some things are important to do. Uh, it's important, very important, to be there for friends at their happiest, friends and family, at their happiest and at their saddest. Um, because those emotions are the ones that tie you to people. So if you have to be, you know, I, it's a horrible way of putting it. You gotta be at weddings and you have to be at funerals. It's a horrible way of putting it, but it's the sentiment that you show you care when you do that. And that ties people to you in a way that other things don't. Do you have any regrets, things that you wish you had done differently? I talked a little bit about it earlier. We started talking about it. I was so driven in most of my life, driven by the sense of having to accomplish a lot in what I anticipated would be a short life, that um, I sometimes didn't spend enough time getting to know my friends more intimately. They were my friends, we did things together, we shared experiences together, but I didn't talk to them about my emotions. I talked to you about this book being my therapy. Don't go through college 
and law school the way we did. Um, slow yourself down enough to really talk to people about who they are inside of themselves. That is really, really something I regret, that it took me so long in my life to learn how to do that. I took way too long. So Belinda Solyesa, who's a sociology major, is Belinda here? There she is. Hello. Um, you have a picture with me already. Uh -huh. OK. You want another one? Ah, come on. <laughs> Mom's going to say no to two pictures. I know. I know. <laughs> okay. All right. So Belinda is thinking about all the students who want to be lawyers in the audience. How many of those are there? Yeah. Okay. okay. Good. Not bad. Thank you. What advice would you give to students interested in law as a career? You know, I went to law school really not knowing what being a lawyer was like. Um, I got my knowledge of lawyering basically from books and movies. I will tell you that there is not one scene in any courtroom lawyering movie I've seen <laughs> that has ever happened in real life. <laughs> All right, it, it just doesn't. Have you watched How to Get Away with Murder? Um, I don't understand that show. It's too complicated for me. <laughs> As a law professor, I'm baffled. <laughs> I, I, I got to tell you something. I, I don't know how successful it'll be. And part of my problem is I'm always multitasking, so I don't actually see something from beginning to end. I'm reading, doing something in between. But if I can't understand the storyline faster, it loses me, you know? And, but she does look like she's not really teaching people to have the kind of integrity that I like in the practice of law. It's a little slip shot. Yeah, yeah, a little. Um, I, you have to have some idealism to go into lawyering. You have to have a desire to really want to help people. Um, because that's what lawyers do. We help people with problems or we help them to run their business or their lives in a better way, or at least to structure their lives in a better way. That's what business people do. They help entities or individuals come together and negotiate deals and figure out how to do something together in a better way. So to be a lawyer, you have to start with having that desire, that passion. But I also think it would be helpful before you invest all that money in going to law school that you actually expose yourself to some real lawyering to make sure that it is something that actually does appeal to you. Um, you know, one of my nephews said to me, I want to be a lawyer, Titi, I like arguing. <laughs> and I said to him, but sweetie, Lawyering is not about arguing. It's about persuading. And those are two very different things. And he asked me what to do. And I said, I want you to do an internship somewhere. And I'll help you get it so you can see exactly what it is lawyers are doing. And that's what I would suggest to you to do in college. Um, and it doesn't even have to be a whole semester. But maybe take a Christmas break and go to the Federal Defender's Office, the State Defender's Office, a prosecutor's office, a law firm. Tell them you're a college student. And can you uh, run errands for them? That's all you have to do. You want to see what's happening. And take a look at what they actually do. Visit a courtroom. Sit in on a negotiation. Um, find out if it, that passion that you have, that it's a venue that you're going to be able to exercise it in a way that will satisfy you. 
So I have a question from David Gonzalez, who is an aerospace engineering major. He's a rocket scientist. Where is I always love people who are in STEM. It really pleases me. Come on over. So David wanted to know, um, how do you deal with situations where your family has problems and you want to help them, but you don't want your efforts to derail your own plans or progress for yourself? <sighs> we did talk about this. Yeah. And, and we talked about um, how uh, sometimes you have to accept their disappointment, knowing that what you're doing for them is better not just for you, but for them. You know, they're, they're, for a lot of our parents who are from other places, they actually don't know the value of education because it's, they've never seen it in their own lives. And their needs are so great today that you feel compelled to help them now, not realizing that what you give them now is in comparison to what you can give them and do for them later, infinitesimally small. Um, sometimes you almost have to educate them. I mentioned earlier that there are studies that talk about what the difference in earnings are between high school and college graduates. And they are sobering statistics. There was a time in our culture where the difference between what you could earn as a high school graduate and as a college graduate, the difference was much, much smaller. Today, they're like this. I think you earn college, high school graduates are earning 80% less than college graduates. And those are statistics that are important for you to share with your family because you're all making sacrifices. But perhaps if they can see it, if you can explain it to them, that they might be able to appreciate it. And when they can't, you have to learn how to forgive yourself. Because if you're doing it for them and not just for yourself, you have to realize that the one thing you've been given is the gift of knowledge. And it is its own blessing. And that sometimes you have to take that blessing and share it by just doing the right thing. And the right thing is bettering yourself for their future and your own. So. so. Forgiveness is real important. So this is the last question. Um, there are two kinds of lawyers in the world. Those who imagine themselves on the Supreme Court and those who won't admit it. All right, everyone has dreamed of it if you're a lawyer. What is it like when you actually are there in the black robe, you're part of the court? What does that feel like? What does it feel like when the phone rings and it's the president telling you he's going to nominate you? Um, I am now repeating myself because I've been on so many audiences, but I know I haven't talked to this, uh, about this to this group. Uh, I didn't believe the president was going to pick. There were a lot of compelling reasons why he shouldn't have. Among them, there were enough New Yorkers on the court. There certainly were enough Catholics on the court. Um, I had already been labeled in certain newspapers as not smart enough, <laughs> um, and by others as um, too liberal. So uh, he knew, or should have known, that there would be a lot of attacks and controversy. And I thought that any sane president, and I'm glad he's not sane, OK? <laughs> but that any sane person would seek somebody less controversial than me. And so when the call came the night before my nomination, I was in a state of shock. I truly did not expect the call. And it started with uh, answering my cell phone and the 
uh, voice on the other end said, uh, I'm a White House operator. Would you please hold for the president? <laughs> and I've described to, some, uh, to someone yesterday that I don't know, I have a condition where that sometimes when my heart beats, I can hear it in my ears. I'm told that it, not everybody has that. But I'm one of those people, OK? There was one, a kid in the audience yesterday who was shaking his head yes. And I was looking at him and saying, not everybody does that. I thought everybody did that. But my heart started to race so hard that I thought that the president would be hearing it on the phone. Because <laughs> it's right in my ear, OK? And so I had the phone in my left hand, and my heart here, my hand here, trying to slow my heartbeat down. And he then tells me he's going to nominate me. And the tears started to come out of my eyes. And as you know, I'm not a crier. And, but they were unbidden and certainly not planned. Did I fantasize about it? No. Not even a little. Um, I'm very practical. And I had written off the possibility years before. But I knew it was a moment like no other. And I understood that it was a moment that I would never have again. <laughs> You're only given that chance once. And it was overwhelming the sentiment, just overwhelming. Um, the follow-up to that story was that, that 12 hours, and it was literally 12 hours between his call and being at the White House and standing at the front stage, just before I came out of the uh, back East Room to walk into the uh, public announcement. I was there walking with the president and vice president, and they're uh, much taller men than I. <laughs> and so they were walking much faster than I was. And I <laughs> whispered, please, slow down. <laughs> and they turned around, literally at the same moment, looked at me, and smiled. And at that moment, I had an outer body experience. <laughs> I literally had to have my emotional state detach from my body. Because I was so overwhelmed by the emotion, for a year and a half, through that whole speech, through the Senate confirmation, through my first year on the bench, I lived my emotional conscious state like up in the clouds looking down. It took me such a long time to reconnect with myself. I kept telling people I would wake up in every morning and expect somebody to pinch me so I'd wake up. There's almost a sense of disbelief. You were talking about the J-Lo moment. I was there looking around. Um, I walked into the room, and in the distance, I saw an ancient bone. How do I know that? Because I used to love looking at them in museums. And I'm looking at it, and I'm going, that thing's real. OK? So I walk over, and it is an ancient bone. And I look at Mark Anthony, and he says, I'm a collector. And I collect presidential letters. And he walked me around to another um, case, and there was an Abraham Lincoln letter. I thought only museums had that stuff, OK? I guess you have to have enough money to have that stuff, but you can. <laughs> and I was just sort of shaking my head and thinking to myself, am I really here? And I've done a lot of that. Mm -hmm. I've done so much of that. Um, there is no way to experience what I do and actually all the time feel it's real. Um, 
And then you come down to yourself and you continue to know why I named my book, My Beloved World. Because it is my beloved world. And one that still has its bumps and its difficulties and still has moments of sorrow and tragedy. Um, but overall, I'm grateful for my many blessings. And they've been a lot. Well, I think we're all still pinching ourselves that this happened and that you're here. So I wanted to thank the marshals on behalf of San Jose State for all of their work. Um, and I especially wanted to thank senior marshal Jason Wong, who's been a model of professionalism, which is not surprising since he is a loyal alumnus of San Jose State. So Absolutely. And we should also thank Professor Alanis and the organizing committee for all of their hard work. And one major thank you to the justice, um, Esther Hernandez, who is an amazing artist. Um, she does amazing prints of Chicana and Latina themes. And she has a beautiful print for you from the school. It's titled Mis Madres. And it is a visual eulogy to our abuelitas, our abuelas and madres who have come before us and who through their unswerving dedication and devotion and resilience, have strived to make a better life for all of us. And they're always with us. You've got to see this. I'm hogging it because it's spectacular. This is her grandmother. And I see my grandmother's eyes. In. Well, this is Esther's grandmother in the painting yeah. I think all grandmothers have the same eyes. Don't they? <laughs> it's the eyes of worry. It's love and worry. It, uh, yeah. yeah, it's that deep, deep love. Que no, que nada te pase a ti. That's what they all say. Exactly. For those of you who don't have a grandmother, you probably have a more elderly relative who's a surrogate. Treasure them. Treasure them. Um, they will guide you for the rest of your life. Thank you.